All thinking people, in their quiet moments, ask themselves the eternal questions. Why am I here? What is the reason for all existence? What is up there? How did the universe happen? We still ask the same questions, as did our ancestors, about ourselves, our environment, and our place in the cosmic scheme of matter and life. But today, our present attempts to find answers are aided by experimental tools made possible by modern technology. We are in a period of grand technological progress, striving to fit a load of recent discovery into a new emerging scientific philosophy. Space technology provides the first truly global platform for observing the Earth. The scientific data about the Earth obtained from space technology have added greatly to our knowledge of the Earth. Now it has become evident that the future of mankind depends on what we can achieve in space. Exploring the moon, planets, the depth of the universe might excite man's pioneering spirit, but practical applications of space technology have proved to be of more importance to mankind. Early space exploration and utilization were conducted almost entirely by the United States and the Soviet Union. But over the years, with more and more countries realizing the potential of space technology, they began turning to space power. The firing of a two-stage rocket on 21st of November 1963 from an unlikely little Kerala fishing village, Tumba, saw the birth of the Indian space program. As I was at Summerfield, um, I started working there from August uh, 1963. Around November 63, there was a news saying that India has launched the NICAP HG rocket for sounding the atmosphere and since the rocket requires rocket motors and I was working in the design development and production of rocket motors it stuck in my mind that okay what I would like to do is when I go back to India which I was going to do anyway um, I joined the Thumba station and then I came to Trivandrum I came to Thumba and uh, there was hardly any facility there in fact, uh, my office was in the church building and uh, I was given a, um, a cow shed and a cattle feed store along with that to furnish my laboratory there. The launch was smooth and problem free. India had entered the space age. It will be our constant endeavor in the years to come to provide the peaceful uses of outer space for the real problems of this nation. The father of the Indian space program, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, held the view that it was not a question whether a developing country such as India could afford to go in for space technology, but whether it could afford not to. It required an extraordinary vision and courage of conviction to state so in the 1960s. There are some who question the relevance of space activities in a developing nation. To us, there is no ambiguity of purpose. We do not have the fantasy of competing with the economically advanced nations in the exploration of the moon or the planets or manned space flight. But we are convinced that if we are to play a meaningful role nationally and in the community of nations, we must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies to the real problems of man and society. Dr. Sarabhai took a series of decisions that formed the basis of the Indian space program. We would make our own rockets, our own satellites, our own satellite launch vehicles. Objectives were important. And from that objective point of view, I could see that while the India's solid propellant technology was confined to just like a tiny, almost like a Diwali rocket, maybe 10 kilograms or so, what the space program required was many, many times higher. The 60s were primarily devoted to building up of expertise and infrastructure. 
Though there was some assistance from France, USA and USSR, most of the efforts were indigenous. By 1965, a space science center was established in Tumba. And on Independence Day 1969, the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, was formed under the Department of Atomic Energy. Subsequently, in 1972, ISRO was brought under the Department of Space, DOS, and has since been responsible for the execution of the National Space Program. ISRO, as you recall, uh, was formed out of uh, an initial uh, effort to study a space science related problems, uh, particularly over the geomagnetic equator uh, passing over the Tumba, the southern part of India. And uh, so the objective at that point uh, was to uh, use the space techniques for the exploration of the atmosphere, the ionosphere, and the Earth's environment. The 70s were a crucial phase for the development of the Indian space program. Under Professor Satish Dhawan's guidance, the decade saw a lot of successes for ISRO. The Satellite Instructional Television Experiment, SITE, using the US satellite ATS-6, saw the telecast of a series of educational programs on health, family planning, agriculture, and the like in over 2,500 villages. The launch of the first Indian satellite, Aryabhatta, from the USSR was followed by Bhaskara 1 and 2 and Apple, an experimental communication satellite. The successes of these projects were responsible for India's decision to procure its own satellite system, INSAT. While the first generation of INSAT satellites were procured from the United States, the second generation INSAT 2 series are designed and built by ISRO. The INSAT system is a multi-purpose satellite system catering primarily to the needs for telecommunications, television broadcasting and meteorology. We are doing developmental communications and developmental communications which are related to bringing in uh, information or knowledge to the population, particularly in rural areas, on areas like agricultural practices, health, hygiene, uh, the watershed uh, development, uh, the role of women in Panchayati Raj. A good example of this is the Jabua Development Communication Project undertaken by ISRO to specially tailor a satellite-based network configuration to transmit television programs to meet the needs of rural areas. Jabua, with about 1,300 villages, is predominantly a tribal district with a low literacy rate of 14.5%. The aim is to build channels of communications in all directions to promote self-reliance and optimal use of local resources. Over 150 direct reception television sets have been installed in as many villages. Earth orbiting satellites have given scientists an opportunity to observe, monitor and study our planet as an entire system, including the dynamics of its atmosphere and the changing character of its land areas in response to natural or human modification. Remote sensing technology is used for several applications such as crop acreage and yield estimation, wasteland mapping, water resource management, marine resources, glaciology, etc. Today, India operates a large constellation of remote sensing satellites including IRS-1C and IRS-1D 
which provide the best spatial resolution among the world's civilian remote sensing satellites. These satellites provide vital information with a variety of resolution and we have now used these satellites for applications uh, which are in the areas like agriculture, for example, we have worked considerably and demonstrated the capability of our IRS system for agric agricultural crop uh, production and yield forecasting. One of the most unique applications of IRS data is the Integrated Mission for Sustainable Development, launched in 1992. It covers 175 districts and is aimed at deriving local specific prescriptions for sustainable development using satellite and collateral socio-economic data. These uh, data is received, for example, at Norman in Oklahoma. It is received at North Wales in Germany. It is received in Thailand. It is going to be received in Japan. It's being received in Korea. It's going to be received in Dubai and Saudi Arabia. So that I can just see the type of the extent of the uh, IRS outreach today in terms of ability to provide data to the users. And uh, of course, currently we are almost at the level of something like 10% of the world's data sales or remote sensing, which is based on the IRS data. And I'm sure that it will double in the coming uh, next to two or three years. Speaking of markets, the commercial space market is estimated to be more than $60 billion by the year 2000. This is as against $18 billion in the decade from 1987 to 1996. The space market has been dominated by Ariane Space, a consortium of Europe. Ariane Space, the world's first commercial space transportation company, holds more than 50% of the world market for satellites launched to geostationary orbits, having performed more than 100 commercial launches since the inauguration of the first transportation line in 1984. However, today, Ariane Space has started facing turbulence as newer players like Lockheed Martin have entered the fray. The launch business today is the scene of intensifying competition and the key to this commercial battle turns increasingly to cost. Do you know the current cost per kilogram for putting a payload is up to $25,000 in the geosynchronous orbit and uh, certainly that uh, there is a trend to reduce this to and bring it down 10,000 then 6,000 then 5,000 dollars so you need uh, transportation systems which are cost effective with its satellite launch vehicle program India today has joined the elite group of nations having satellite launching capacity SLV-3 was the first demonstration of India to build satellite launch vehicles it had its first successful flight in July 1980 placing a 35-kilogram Rohini satellite into a near-Earth orbit. Followed two successful launches of the augmented satellite launch vehicle, ASLV, employing solid propellant capable of putting 150 kilograms class payloads in near-circular orbit. But things really got moving with the development of the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, PSLV. PSLV employing solid and liquid propellants is capable of putting over a ton of IRS class of satellites into a polar sun synchronous orbit. There is now the question of developing user confidence if the PSLV is to capture a niche in the space market. Purely in terms of payload capability, the PSLV has all the features of a very good launch vehicle for launching low earth satellites for remote sensing missions or communication satellite systems. The way to achieve user confidence is to launch more and more domestic and foreign satellites. Last year, ISRO signed an agreement with Ariane Space to jointly market the capacity for launching microsatellites. A large number of satellites, especially communications or broadcast ones, being used by smaller corporates are today in the range of 100 to 300 kilograms. These are the potential customers for ISRO. According to Jean-Marie Luton, Chairman and Executive Officer Ariane Space, we will together sell capacities in PSLV and our own launchers. And then, whichever launcher can take a particular satellite up first, will get the money too. On 26th May 1999, India made its foray into the multi-billion dollar international space market by selling its launch vehicle capability to foreign buyers. Accompanying the Indian satellite OceanSat, 
were Kitsat from South Korea and Tubsat from Germany. The global space market is expected to grow at the rate of 10% in the coming years. There are several satellite missions on the planning boards of global organizations. ISRO should try to get orders to launch some of these satellites. Even if India cannot provide services to Western countries, there is still great potential for providing launch services to South Asian countries and the Middle East. And India can offer these services at much cheaper costs. India has now further moved on to the development of the geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle GSLV, which is capable of launching two and a half ton satellites in a geosynchronous transfer orbit. While the initial flights will have the cryogenic upper stage supplied by Russia, ISRO is developing its own indigenous technology for subsequent flights. India shares its experiences with other developing countries by training their personnel under a program called SHARES, Sharing of Experience in Space. An Asia-Pacific Center for Space Science and Technology Education has already been set up and started functioning. Today, we are in an age which is undergoing a major technological revolution. Internet, email, e-commerce, supercomputers have become the order of the day. Therefore, as India enters the new millennium, it is now important to assess where we stand and where is our space program headed. India, I am sure, in 21st century will play a very dynamic and vibrant role in space. India's proven capabilities would be an important element in uh, ensuring that the nation has a committed space service in many of these areas. We may play a role in trying to work with uh, countries today which are established in the space station. So that is the direction one can look at it. And we may also partner with uh, countries in areas where uh, one would like to go beyond what we have been now doing as a conventional space. This will very much depend upon uh, the level of involvement that we should get into the investment that we can afford and the relevance at that point in time, but this could include even things like planetary exploration and things of that kind. Now the kind of things that are taking place in this networked wired world makes it imperative that ISRO is really up on the ball from the plan to the delivery stage. Now that part, that, that interim duration, is what we have to worry about. It is not enough to have beautiful plans, nor is it enough to have delivered goods which are a bit too late. The need of the hour is therefore to give a more corporate look to the department, to involve industries much more. Indigenously, ISRO has been ably supported by various Indian industries and national laboratories. And there are many technologies developed under the space program, which have been transferred to the industries for commercial applications. ISRO has also begun selling satellite components and subsystems to space giants such as Hughes and Matra Marconi. In fact, Europe and Japan justify their entry into the space program primarily for the technological benefits of their industry and therefore commercial benefit to them. In the experience of USA and Europe, the economic benefit from the investments in space efforts is about three to four times the original investments. The onus now lies on the union government to give incentives to Indian industries to get more actively involved and exploit the potential ISRO has created and thus substantially increase its investments in the space program. The problem is going to be capital. What Japan spent on its H2 uh, rocket program in the last 10 years, which is something like 2.5 to 3 billion dollars, I'm told, uh, was the entire cost of the Indian space program over the last 35 years. In 1972, ISRO's budget was 100 million rupees. This has increased over the years to 11.71 billion rupees. However, in comparison, the US budgets over 600 billion rupees for its space program. We just cannot compare the two, I think. You know, we, here we are talking about basic priorities. 
there they are talking about cutting down wastage really the american space program is of course far more ambitious including space shuttle programs human space flight programs planetary probes etc if if you see the uh, uh, american experience it has also been driven by the military uh, prerogatives and uh, you know uh, strategic thinking whereas isro i think has been for the developmental need a question thus arises on the peaceful versus military uses of outer space a prime difficulty in establishing a distinction between the two is that none exists in fact goals of national prestige military superiority scientific exploration and commercial exploitation override clear distinction national security provides a common thread between these indistinguishable space objectives in fact a number of countries have linked their civilian space program to a missile military program however it is important to note here that india and japan are the only two countries in the world whose launch vehicle program did not arise out of its missile programs the indian space program has done well so far despite organizational problems and in spite of funding that is truly frugal by international standards not only in building world class satellites for communications and remote sensing but also the launch of remote sensing spacecraft from its own launch vehicles to think we didn't even have this technology 36 years ago india now has the infrastructure all she needs is a strong push into the next millennium